Welcome back again. To fully understand online writing, we need to look at the overall history of communication, the oral tradition, the print tradition, and then the mass electronic media tradition. First, let's start with an examination of the oral and print cultures. The required text for this week was chapter one of the book Blogging by Jill Walker Retberg, and it looks at what is a blog. Here's a quick explanation that the author provides about the cultural shift due to blogging and online media. We are moving from a culture dominated by mass media, using one-to-many communication, to one where participatory media, using many-to-many -many communication, is becoming the norm. I mentioned that in one of my prior lecture presentations. Traditional media simply broadcast their messages to passive audiences. New media allow everyone to participate to create and broadly share their own messages. But it's not as simple as one medium repla replacing another. I mentioned remediation when I talked about hypertext, when the old media are transformed into something new, so aspects of those other media are still present in the new media. Retberg writes, rather than simply being a form born in opposition to mass media, Blogs have aspects in common with many other forms of communication during the last centuries. So we can't look at it as traditional media versus new media. It's not old-fashioned media versus online media. Rather, it's aspects of all the communication forms that came before that are now present in this new form of sharing ideas. The oral culture can be seen in conversational blogs, instant messages, chat rooms, text messages, videos, and podcasts. The print culture can be seen in newspaper and magazines online such as nytimes.com, the Wall Street Journal's wsj.com, and time.com, online-only publications such as Slate and Salon, and aggregators that compile links to other online text stories such as the Drudge, Re the Drudge Report. The electronic culture can be seen in podcasts and video blogs on iTunes, audio files on Pandora, and online videos on Hulu, YouTube, and Netflix. All of those online media owe something to the traditional media that came before. Let's examine oral culture. Before there was writing, before there were electronic gadgets, our ancestors communicated with their bodies and voices. Physical communication involved facial expressions, hand gestures, and body movement. Verbal communication involved symbolic sounds, spoken languages, and dialects. The skills our ancient ancestors needed to communicate in oral cultures included physicality and body language, vocabulary or the collection of words that are available to represent what you mean, and rhetoric, the various ways to effectively string those words together which we'll talk about in an upcoming presentation. We're still using oral techniques to get our messages across. Stand-up comics, television news anchors, politicians, business executives, teachers, all still rely on those same sets of skills. And we'll see some of it is still present in online media. Oral communication is primarily one-to-one -one or one to few. It is communication limited to those within hearing distance or physical proximity. Your audience is whoever is within earshot, whoever is close enough to hear and understand the sounds coming out of your mouth. There is the potential for dialogue or two-way communication, a back and forth between the speaker and the listener. Since it takes place in a finite moment, Messages are subject to memory limitations and misinterpretation. There is no time machine to turn back the clock and hear someone say something again. You have to rely on how you perceived it as it happened, and then how you remember it afterwards, if you remember it at all. Did you ever play the game of telephone, in which one person whispers a story in someone's ear, and then that person whispers it to someone else, and so on? until finally later another person tries to whisper the same story to the first person but by that time the story is drastically different from how it started that's one of the pitfalls of oral communication Retberg writes 
some aspects of blogging are very similar to oral cultures. Even in the online electronic form, aspects of oral tradition carry over. What are some of those oral features of online writing? First, blogs are usually conversational and social. Their tone tends to be less formal and closer to everyday speech than the general tone of print writing. In that way, it's similar to the way we structure words and sentences together in everyday conversation, rather than the way we do it in the more carefully constructed print realm. Still, we have to be careful not to fall into the trap so many make and mistakenly think that all the rules of print culture no longer apply. Next, another oral feature that we see online is that blogs are constantly changing. Blogs can be and frequently are edited, with corrections being made after a post's initial publication. Just like in oral communication, when we can immediately correct something we said or change gears after determining our audience's tone, online we have the luxury of being able to quickly and efficiently correct mistakes or make any changes we wish relatively easily. Unlike in print or traditional electronic media where such changes are logistically more difficult, more expensive, and not immediate at all. Most blogs allow comments. A reader can ask questions or insert commentary. If the original online writer does not directly respond, other readers might, either through additional comments or via their own separate blog entries. Blogs appear to be closer to what Retberg calls the reciprocity of oral communication that Plato appreciated than to the unresponsiveness of traditional writing. That means that there's a back and forth between the speaker and the listener in the oral tradition. Plato wrote dialogues where people talk with each other instead of to or at each other, and he praised dialogue as a form of communication that is more valuable than dissemination or distribution or what we call today broadcasting of content, such as writing or a public speech given to a large audience. Yet it's ironic that the words of Socrates might be long forgotten if Plato hadn't chosen to write them down. Retberg says, writing is a technology itself even without the printing press or the computer. Writing changed communication. Through the use of a writing implement on a writing surface, paint on a wall, a stylus on clay, a pencil or pen on paper, people could communicate in ways like never before. Writing allowed things not possible in oral traditions. What are those differences? The limitations of space and time are broken. You no longer need to be near someone to communicate with them. People can read your words on different continents or years later as long as they have a copy of a book in their hands with your words written on the pages. It has a sense of permanence. Every time you look at it, the words won't change, allowing the message to be repeatedly studied and analyzed. But there's one strength of oral communication that was lost in writing, and later print. What is it? Oral communication has the potential for instant two-way dialogue. Writing and print are only one-way communication. Any response, question, or additional comment the reader might have when reading something in print is delayed by the time needed to write, reproduce, and or distribute the written message. Online writing has brought back dialogue to written communication. Let's look at how writing evolved from its earliest historic stages to the age of print. The earliest forms of intentional writing are pieces of ochre rock with geometric patterns found in a cave in South Africa about 75,000 BC. The systematic pattern suggests that the markings represent information rather than just decoration. Those lines you see on the rock probably weren't carved into the rock surface, surface to be pretty. They were meant to communicate something. The written information could have been used to keep track of time, 
to help manage the agricultural cycle or for barter or other commercial transactions. The intent was to write something that a reader could understand. Symbolic writing evolved as human beings started using drawings and symbols representing concepts and words, eventually leading to phonetic writing, representing specific sounds. The oldest cave paintings were discovered in France dating back to about 30,000 BC. The purpose could have been coming-of-age rituals, training youngsters to hunt, maybe for storytelling, or even just representational art. It's clear that the paintings depict people and animals, and the viewer is supposed to recognize them as such. These early artists told stories, for whatever purpose, through these symbolic renderings. Around 3500 until 2900 BC, written communication began to take shape. The Sumerians developed cuneiform writing, pictographs written on clay tablets. The Egyptians developed hieroglyphic writing. The Phoenicians developed an alphabet written from right to left. Writing enabled a standardized form of long-lasting communication, and this was a link to empire building. All the big empires had some form of written language that enabled the rulers to communicate with the masses, eventually at great distances. Around 1775 BC, the Greeks invented a phonetic alphabet written from left to right. This led to the standard alphabet for Western civilization when Romans picked up many aspects of ancient Greek culture, introducing their own alphabet. Early Chinese writing was discovered on bone, dating back to about 1400 BC. Oracle bones and shells featured inscriptions by spiritual leaders answering divine questions. These stones were heavy to carry compared to what came next. From 500 BC to 170 BC, papyrus rolls and early parchments made of dried reeds became the first known portable and light writing surfaces. Now people could easily carry writings with them. Then in 105 BC, paper as we know it was invented in China. It was the almost perfect medium for writing. The paper scrolls gave way to an even better design in the first century AD. The codex, loose sheets of wood, paper, or other material bound together, usually with a cover, was invented by the Romans and became the book format we are familiar with today. In 305 AD, China invented the first wooden printing press with symbols carved on a wooden block. It wasn't practical since the written Chinese language had too many characters. The wooden construction wasn't as durable as metal, and it was a longer, more cumbersome process to use. Then everything changed. In 1455 AD, Johann Gutenberg invented a printing press with metal movable type. Clay movable type had been invented as early as 1049, but it was not practical for mass printing. This new printing press, with its quick and easy repetitive motion and reliable construction, could print large quantities of identical pages. So here's the big shift from oral culture to print culture. Print was one to many. One writer could reach many readers. The limitations of space and time were broken. The weakness compared to oral culture was that print was only one-way communication. But it had a sense of permanence. The words on the page, once printed, were set and unchangeable. So readers could revisit it at any time, studying and analyzing the message, returning to the unchanging source multiple times if necessary. Redberg writes, Print caused the transformation from a society where spoken discourse was the norm to one where silent reading and writing was a main form of communication. She continues, perhaps the radical increase of dissemination was the most obvious feature of print. Texts were spread throughout the world on a scale never before seen. It is easy to see the parallels to the radical increase in access to texts that has become possible with the web.
suddenly everybody was getting their hands on printed texts. It really is comparable to the sudden explosion of information that happened when the internet went mainstream. Online writing today features aspects of both oral culture and print culture. Blogs are remarkable for combining aspects of both dialogue, you can communicate back and forth with your readers, and dissemination, you can broadcast your message widely. What are some of the benefits of print and reading that changed our culture? First, standardization. Standard text having the same words printed in copy after copy without the mistakes of handwritten, hand-painted manuscripts allowed people to possess the identical same words that many other people were reading. Second, if another book came out with different information, the mistakes could be easily noticed. This identification of errata, or lists of known errors, enabled readers to compare and correct errors or updates in different print editions. Third, organization. Society developed different agreed-upon methods to organize all that information that was being printed. Table of contents, indices, alphabetization, categorization, all kept things in order and made it easy to find and organize. Fourth, data collection. We can now compile various information and build upon the knowledge that came before, so civilization saw the quick expansion of the fields of science, history, and other studies. This led to an explosion in knowledge as readers and writers were able to add to prior discoveries and fill in the blanks without having to repeatedly reinvent the wheel. Fifth, preservation. Multiple copies were now possible instead of a few rare manuscripts that could easily be damaged or lost and hard to replace, so print enabled us to save books and the information in them for posterity. Lastly, amplification and the reinforcement of ideas. Ideas were suddenly magnified, subject to peer review. People could agree with you and reinforce what you have to say or disagree with you and offer stronger arguments so concepts such as liberty and equality gain traction with the masses. So those are the benefits of print communication that carried over to today. Standardization, identification of errors, organization, data collection, preservation, and the amplification and reinforcement of ideas. Redberg mentions Another deep way in which print influenced our culture in general, and communication in particular, is the increase in literacy that occurred with the greater access to books. Reading, and then writing, was no longer just a skill for the ruling class, or the wealthy, or the politically connected. Now everyone had the desire to be literate. So what is literacy? Literacy is the ability to read. But literacy is also the ability to write. All the people out there have the potential to learn to both read and write, to read the ideas of others, and to possibly write and share their own ideas. It was a major historic shift. Today, new kinds of literacy are developing as the, gener as the general population is acquiring new skills, the ability both to read and navigate the web and to publish its own words images, videos, blogs, and other content. The new literacies have been called network literacy, multi-literacies, digital literacy, and secondary literacy. New literacy demands a new skill set. The most recent medium, the internet, is increasing the amount of reading and writing in which people engage, what Retberg calls a form of textual practice. We've all heard how online writing is going to be the death of print, but writing is much more important to online communication than it was to some of the media that came before. In the 20th century, radio, movies, and television moved in upon print's territory, and people falsely predicted that it would mark the doom of print. It's a common idea that print privileges focused attention, 
It requires the reader to focus on the words and not be distracted. Compared to broadcast media's channel surfing and the web's hypertextuality which I talked about in my prior lecture presentation. Yet I argue that even traditional broadcast media require more focused attention than new media with its link following connectivity. When you channel surf before the days of the DDR, you lost what you skipped. But in cyberspace, you can hyperlink back and forth and still return to the original starting point. It offers you the power to choose your own path unlike the straight linear structure of print and yes even movies radio and TV. Redberg writes as print became commonplace throughout the 16th century a great shift occurred in our understanding of what literature and information was. When we learned to record and broadcast sound and later moving pictures Sounds and images became governed by the same logic of its distribution and ownership as print had been. So print culture was in many ways very similar to the electronic culture that followed, except that the electronic age put a lot of focus and importance on image and audio, how the subject matter appeared and sounded. This was the development of the idea of communication as a commodity, something that can be owned, bought, sold and controlled. Print had a huge impact on other media thanks to that printing press that started it all. 1. It allowed for mass distribution. You could send your message practically anywhere in the world. 2. The uniformity, the sameness of printed material and later radio, movies and television allowed for critical analysis. A reader could study and make judgments about what was being read. 3. People discovered that this all had commercial value. People would pay for a book, eventually for a magazine or a newspaper. People would pay to advertise to reach those eyes and ears. And since there was money to be made, that leads us to 4. Media was seen as a business. So the goal of publishers of newspapers, magazines, and books is to sell as many copies as possible. This led to the purpose of electronic media in the modern age. Reach the masses, as many as possible, and then sell those eyeballs to advertisers. That's the impact of print on other media. Mass distribution, critical analysis, commercial value, and media as business. It's worth repeating what Repberg said. The most recent medium, the internet, is increasing the amount of reading and writing people engage in, a form of textual practice. Even with the importance of visual and audio aspects of online content, reading and writing are still key components of the online experience, building on what came before and changing it at the same time. So that's part one of our look at the history of communication and how it developed into the media landscape we find ourselves in now. In my next lecture presentation, part two, we'll investigate electronic mass media and the internet. See you then.